Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for Aid, Geopolitics, and Power, our human rights back on the international aid agenda. This is the fifth in a series, the Yale Development Dialogues, Economic Policy Lessons from History, which is co-hosted by the Yale Economic Growth Center, the South Asian Studies Council from the Yale Macmillan Center, and the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. I'm Catherine Cheney, and I'll be your moderator today. I'll briefly introduce the topic and our panelists before we dive in, but as I always reiterate, these events are designed to be conversational and we really value your questions. So if you're joining us on Zoom, please keep your questions coming throughout in the Q&A and we'll get to them as soon as we can. So this topic is such a great fit for our approach in this series, bringing historians and practitioners together. When higher income countries get involved in lower income countries, whether through foreign aid, disaster relief or military intervention, they can justify their acts by the goals to reduce poverty, protect human rights, or advance their own interests. And part of why we're having this conversation today is due to some recent structural changes at major international development agencies here in the US, as well as in the UK, marking shift in priorities. So yesterday was Samantha Power's confirmation hearing as President Joe Biden's pick for administrator for the US Agency for International Development. And as many of you know, the UK's Department for International Development merged with the Foreign Commonwealth Office, uniting development and diplomacy in one new department, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, or FCDO. So USAID and FCDO, two acronyms you'll be hearing about a lot today, uh, as some of the shifts we're seeing, and we'll talk about what lessons history might offer. What les lessons might history offer as these agencies change their structure in pursuit of new priorities? Our panelists are gonna look at foreign interventions of the past, their stated intentions and real world effects, and they'll ask what this renewed emphasis on human rights might mean for poverty reduction in a world of extreme inequality. So joining us to discuss these topics, I'd like to introduce Melissa Dell. She's a professor of economics at Harvard University. Her work focuses on long run economic development, primarily in Latin America and Asia. And she's conducted research on how US military strategies in Vietnam had a lasting impact on that country's institutions. You'll hear more about that in some of her other research today. Samuel Moyne is Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale University and author of Not Enough, Human Rights in an Unequal World, very relevant to today's discussion. His areas of interest in legal scholarship include international law, human rights, the law of war, and legal thought in both historical and current perspective. And two familiar names for those of you, for those of you who have joined us before. Uh, Rohini Panda is the Henry J. Hines II Professor of Economics and Director of the Economic Growth Center at Yale. Her research is largely focused on how formal and informal institutions shape power relationships and patterns of economic and political advantage in society, particularly in developing countries. And Rory Stewart is a senior fellow at the Yale Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, where he focuses on contemporary politics in crisis and on international development and intervention in fragile and conflict-affected conflict states. And Rory also served as the UK Secretary of State for International Development, DFID, which I mentioned earlier, where he doubled the UK's investment in international climate and environment. So I'd like to start uh, with Rohini, actually, because uh, Rohini was really the person who put this on the agenda uh, for our Yale Development Dialogues as something to discuss, something where history may offer lessons for today. Uh, so Rohini, can you expand on some of the trends you're seeing in foreign aid, development policy, and governance in the 21st century, particularly in a low and middle income country context? And what does this demand, or why does this demand this question we're asking today, are human rights back on the international aid agenda? Thanks, Catherine, and thanks everyone for joining. So let me just step back a couple of decades to the start of the 21st century, which I think was a very heady time for international development. Economic growth in many parts of Asia were fast reducing poverty and coming on the heels of the Jubilee 2000 debt relief, rich countries were typically expanding their aid programs. So much so that according to one Brookings estimate, by 2006, the amount of foreign aid available in the world was sufficient to bring every extreme poor person up to the threshold of $1.90 a day. And alongside, on the research side, in development economics, we saw a growing interest in quantifying the impact of development policies. And this was exemplified by the rise of the experimental analysis of development projects. But while that research has flourished and was exemplified by the Nobel Prize in 2019 to Banerjee, Duflo, and Kramer, I think the politics of aid started taking a different turn in the second decade of the 21st century. So in 2013, both Canada and Australia merged their aid departments with their foreign offices. 
And then Catherine, as you mentioned, uh, in June of last year, Boris Johnson uh, announced the merger of the Foreign Commonwealth Office with the Department of International Development to create what they described as a new super department, the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And most recently, uh, Samantha Parr has been formally given a table at the National Security Council, recognizing that the mission of US aid alongside defense and diplomacy is contributing to national security. And a common narrative, which actually goes back to what Abbott said as the Australian uh, head at the time of the merger, was I quote, we are going to bring aid back inside the department because we want Australia's aid program to be fully integrated into our overall diplomatic effort. We don't want our diplomacy going in one direction and our aid program going in another. And so what we see today is that rich countries are increasingly explicit about a desire to leverage foreign aid for domestic goals. And I think this raises this question of what happens to the world's poor and vulnerable. And so this brings us today to the start of the third decade of the 21st century, which I see as marked by two forces. First, we're entering a decade where perhaps because of austerity policies in rich countries, because of growing inequality, rich countries are extremely willing to see development quite explicitly as a situation of power, one where they're going to use their resources and their geopolitical might to buy leverage. But importantly, we are also entering a decade of democratic backsliding in many parts of the world. So we are seeing cases of elect elected re rulers, you know, weakening checks on executive power, curtailing political and civil liberties and undermining the integrity of the electoral system, very often in, I'd say, lower and higher middle income countries. And this is what really brings me to this idea that I think we need to revisit the implications of putting human rights on the table. To date, very few aid agencies have led with it. But as we see growing inequality, uh, which makes it harder for them to dole out just cash transfers to uh, the poor, and as we see democratic backsliding, we want, I think it's important to ask what the challenges are in putting human rights as being central to development agenda. And let me just say what I see as the challenge for development economists, uh, of which I am one. I think that the challenge is that over the last two decades, we've seen a lot of push on uh, testing programs in the social sector of saying we want to put resources uh, where uh, we can test it. But how do you do, how do you actually identify how can you help liberal democracies in the developing world? You know, what institutions can we support? How do we actually test whether that works? And then, you know, how do we persuade rich countries to put money there? For instance, one example where I think we do have evidence is on independent and credible media. We have a lot of evidence from actually field experiments suggesting that they help with accountability. But to me, the open question is, how is this actually going to become part of what aid agencies do? So over to you, Catherine, with that. Thank you, Rohini. And um, you set us up well by talking about how rising inequality may demand some change, may put uh, human rights back on the table, even if agencies haven't led with it. And that brings me to a question for Sam. So Sam, in your book, you explore why the rise of human rights over time has not actually resulted in social and economic justice, but instead happened alongside growing inequality as Rohini described. So can you expand on that disconnect for us? Sure, to begin with, thanks for the invitation and thanks for having me. Um, I look forward to learning a lot. You know, uh, I'm, I, I would have said that starting in the 40s, uh, the human rights agenda and the development agenda have been pretty disconnected and remain so to this day. It's, it's really never the twain shall meet rather than the, the idea that human rights were connected to development or, and are now being put back. Uh, in, in the 1940s, there was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which came along with some basic standards in the economic realm, which we call economic and social rights. Harry Truman in my country uh, announced point four, which is conventionally dated as the kind of origin of, of development assistance. The trouble is that uh, that that the the ideologies of development have you know uh, waxed and waned according to different orthodoxies uh, amongst uh, economists and have been pretty tightly linked to national security agendas of giving states and that uh, is likely to remain true for as long 
as we can imagine. And as far as I can tell, there, there really hasn't been much connection, even once human rights began to be taken more seriously by the United States and the United Kingdom as foreign policy uh, aspirations in the 1970s. There are a couple of, sec of exceptions to that generalization. There was conditionality um, uh, saying that foreign aid had to be kind of used as a, a, a carrot uh, to in incentivize bad regimes to treat their, their peoples less badly. There was also some, uh, some intersection between Jimmy Carter, uh, at, at that president who kind of brought human rights to the global stage and his development, um, people who began to talk a lot about, about basic needs. Um, you know, to come to your question, you know, my, my own, you know, thesis has been that human rights um, name a kind of sufficiency idea, the, the basic entitlements in that every human should get on, on the basis of his, her, their humanity, you know, housing, food, health, that, that is not the same as a, a campaign against global poverty, although it's true that the campaign against global poverty of the last 40 or 50 years has also been about a very, a, a floor of of sufficient provision. It's much lower, let's be honest, a dollar and change a day, the World Bank standard of extreme poverty that Rohini mentioned is, is not the schedule of economic and social rights. More to the point, human rights activists, even once they began taking uh, economic and social rights more seriously alongside free speech and bodily integrity and things like that, um, have been have been persistently critical of development theory for neglecting the much higher floor of protection that human rights are supposed to promise. Um, as of today, I would say there's there's I, I wouldn't think of, aside from Samantha Power's appointment and elevation uh, that there's there's a lot of prospect for human rights coming to development. I mean, that could be a rhetoric. What it means um, is, is hard to say and not all power is not even on the USAID uh, website yet. Um, for one thing, um, the, the, the eradication of poverty has most, 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 mostly not worked through any kind of human rights agenda to date. And it's been very spotty, highly localized in on, on the surface of the world. We've just lived through a pandemic. You know, we're in the final stages of it, hopefully, at least in the global north, which has seen a lot of reversals um, in the anti-poverty agenda. I would um, close by saying, it, it, though power is there, the the stated foreign policy agenda of Joe Biden and his people is actually to care most about the American middle class. And you see that I think most graphically in a March 2 speech that new Secretary of State Antony Blinken gave in which he says that every little bit of the reorientation of American foreign policy, which must include what Samantha Power is going to be doing is really focused on making sure uh, that uh, policymakers don't forget Northern working classes, uh, which led to Donald Trump, you know, many think. Uh, and so the, the, let's make sure not to, you know, um, get, get fooled by the hype that we're on the brink of vast changes. Um, You want to close with that? All right. We'll make sure not to get to get into the hype, or at least we'll break down um, whether this is rhetoric or whether this is real. And I I, I uh, took note of something Sam said, which I think um, really captures one of the themes we're getting at here: um, that a floor of sufficient provision does not equal social and economic rights, and that development theory tends to neglect the much higher floor of protecting uh, that human rights are meant to promise. And um, so we'll see, we'll see if there's change, but um, Sam seems uh, unconvinced that we're on the brink of major change. And um, I think that's great. We're going to get into perhaps some debate among our panelists a bit later. Uh, but I want to go ahead and bring Melissa into this conversation. Melissa, your research has focused on how foreign intervention affects development across a range of geographies, 
And I'd love for you to expand on some of your research in Vietnam. Um, those who may have seen the promotional video for this webinar might have a preview of that. Your research in Vietnam, as well as Mexico, and what lessons from uh, those experiences seem most urgent and relevant today? Uh, thank you so much. And thank you um, also uh, for, uh, for inviting me to be here. Uh, so I want to start by picking up on a point uh, that came up before when Rohini uh, was talking, uh, which is this idea that we've seen in recent years, kind of geopolitical objectives and development aid objectives um, moving closer together and becoming more intertwined. Um, and I'd say that if anything, like that's been the norm and maybe, you know, like in the period after the Cold War, um, you know, uh, people were a bit less anxious about those geopolitical objectives and that relaxed a bit. But I think that that's changing now and kind of with the rise of China and that it's not an accident that this is happening again. And so if you go back um, and you think about the policies in the uh, 1960s with uh, John F. Kennedy, the Alliance for Progress, you know, his other kind of development aid priorities, those were very closely linked to the fight against communism and to the Cold War. And I think that that's just the norm. Um, and, you know, to, to tie this back in uh, to the, the question and to my research, um, and, you know, so broadly speaking, we can think about kind of two different schools of thought about how the U.S. and other uh, rich countries kind of uh, achieve their uh, geopolitical objectives um, in low income countries. Um, and so again, if we go back to the Cold War, there was this very kind of prominent view um, popularized uh, the most by like Walt Rostow, who was an economist and also Lyndon Johnson's national security advisor, um, that, you know, communism is this disease of the transition from being an agricultural to an industrialized society. Um, and, um, you know, uh, the US needed to, to, to stop um, poor countries from succumbing, um, you know, to that disease. And there were two general ways to do it. Um, and so what Rostow and what others advocated for is you do that through force. Um, you make people realize that it's gonna be extremely costly um, if they go against um, you know, the non-communist state in the context of the Cold War. Um, and the other view, which was actually much less sort of uh, prominent historically, but some people did argue for it, is that you have to give people uh, meaningful incentives, um, you know, to support uh, a democracy or to support a non-communist state um, through, you know, through the state providing them things that are meaningful to their lives, you know, schools, health clinics, um, security, um, things like that. Um, and so this is a question that I studied in the context of uh, the Vietnam War, um, where the objective of the US and the Vietnam War, it wasn't so much, you know, stamping out specific insurgents per se, but it was creating a South Vietnamese state that would stand as a bulwark against communism after the US withdrew. And to have that people have to support the state. Um, and so they're very explicitly kind of social scientists, economists, political scientists, et cetera, they thought about like, well, how do you get people um, to, to support the state? And sort of the dominant view and what the US overwhelmingly pursued was to do that through overwhelming firepower. You make it extremely costly. Um, for them to go against the state. Um, and I think like very much game theory was influential kind of in how people thought about this. Um, and just kind of the general intuition that if you go out and you be really aggressive, that they're gonna back down. And so, you know, the US dropped many times more bombs on South Vietnam than were dropped in all of Asia and all of Europe in World War II, just an overwhelming amount of firepower. Um, and in our paper, we're able to exploit exogenous variation from an algorithm that the US used to target these bombings to show that that policy backfired. Um, that when they bombed civilian areas, um, that rather than people saying, oh, like I better do what the US wants and what South, the South Vietnamese government wants, I better support the state. And so they wouldn't join the Viet Cong because they were angry, um, you know, rightfully uh, so. Um, but that wasn't like, you know, that. Um, that wasn't the only thing the U.S. did in Vietnam. That was the dominant perspective. Um, but um, an interesting context that we also look at is that the U.S. Marines, by and large, took a different kind of perspective um, on fighting the war. And so the U.S. Marines have this sort of um, long history of being like, 
the U.S. Imperial Police Force, so to say, like in the Caribbean. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that they did lots of horrible human rights abuses there. Um, but compare that to the army, whose kind of, um, you know, founding motives were just to line up and shoot as many people as possible. It's like a different perspective. They worked a lot more closely with locals. They did development aid. And that's what they pushed in Vietnam. Um, and so we look at this area that was commanded by the Marines uh, versus very nearby places that were commanded by the army. The Marines built schools, they built health clinics, um, they worked closely with locals. And in those areas, you see far yet, um, you know, less attacks on the US. Um, you see people are South Vietnamese citizens and public opinion data are more supportive of all levels of South Vietnamese government. Um, you know, and, and um, the US, they actually you see public goods actually being provided, you know, so obviously we can't say, well, would it have been better if the US just didn't get into this conflict at all, you know, which there's a strong argument for, but like conditional kind of on being there and fighting this conflict, this kind of development aid approach appears to be um, much more effective. Um, and then kind of to tie this idea into the present, I don't think that this is something that is, you know, limited to the Cold War, um, that is limited to foreign intervention per se. There's just this broad idea of like, you have places that are not really um, within the control of the state. Um, and this is very common. Like, how do you bring those places, you know, under the control of a state? And this was also like what I looked at in Mexico, um, at the war on drugs in Mexico. And so this is not exactly foreign intervention, although obviously foreign policy is a big motivator for the war on drugs. And that has had kind of, that's another kind of rich country policy that has had enormous implications um, for the developing world. Um, but I look there at, you know, crackdowns on the drug trade and show something that's, you know, a little bit reminiscent of what we found in Vietnam, which is that um, the state comes in, they crack down on the drug trade in a given location, um, and that weakens the incumbent and leads, you know, their rivals to come in and try to fight. And since the state actually has fairly limited capacity, it just unleashes these drug wars and then people just take the drugs around. Um, and so, you know, it's not as if, um, you know, that this is, I think the goal of Mexico was to get the drugs to like go through the Caribbean. Um, but in the end that didn't happen. They just took other routes in Mexico and it kind of unleashed this violence. Um, and, you know, of course the state side of it is not the only side. We also show that uh, when young men lose their jobs due to trade shocks from China, they're also more likely to go join drug gangs and that creates violence. And so there's an economic component as well. Um, but in general, I think that it's kind of reminiscent of the same debates that came up in the 60s and 70s. You know, so I was talking with, um, you know, some officials in Mexico and there was a group, like an influential group that was really heavily advocating like, okay, let's not just fight this um, through sending in the military. Like let's give development aid. We know in some of these places, there's not other job opportunities. People don't trust the state um, because they've had a bad experience. Maybe the state can come in and build infrastructure and that's useful for creating jobs. Um, and you know, they almost got that program in off, they almost got that program off the ground, but then somebody else came in and was like, wait a minute, like we're national security. Like we don't do development aid. That's for the social development ministry. Like, what do you mean? Like we go in and we show them who's in charge. Um, and I think, you know, to, to tie it back into the beginning and think about kind of the most pressing lessons, you know, at least, you know, I'm not an expert on international diplomacy, um, but people were argue that we're kind of moving into this phase of kind of, um, you know, a, a new Cold War or something like it with China, where China is rising, you know, they're taking kind of a very aggressive stance on the global stage. And, you know, how's that going to play out? Um, and and it kind of um, linking um, this idea of like development aid with diplomacy, like the reality is that diplomacy is just always going to be, you know, that like, um, and like the, the security interests are going to be like the number one objective. Um, but is there a way to do that where, you know, even if it's like grossly inadequate development aid that's, you know, getting people's income up a few cents or something, that's better than going and like, um, you know, um, dropping bombs on them or, you know, encouraging, you know, a government to take on like a violent conflict against people, right? And so um, I think that it is actually a potentially promising thing that these objectives kind of get integrated and how do we think about you know our influence on the global stage not just through being the kind of aggressive the most aggressive you know country around um but also giving people um you know in incentives um 
uh, to, to, to want to support the US or to want to support, you know, um, our objectives um, through, through development aid and other policies. Thanks, Melissa. Really helpful examples in terms of uh, when we look at this connection between development and diplomacy and defense, uh, how has it worked to use incentives versus force over time? And I'm glad you mentioned China. Um, I hope that's uh, something we can return to when we all uh, jump into discussion in a little bit. And we have some great questions coming in. So just a reminder to those of us, uh, those of you joining us on Zoom, please keep those questions coming. I'm excited to get to some of these. But I want to bring Rory into this. Uh, so Rory, we mentioned earlier some of the changes happening with um, foreign aid in the UK. Uh, that aid agenda has undergone quite a transformation over the past year and is still changing, it seems. So I'd like to ask you, what does this mean for the UK's work on human rights? And how has that changed as a priority from when you led DFID to now? And what do you expect next? Oh, Rory, you're on mute. First thing, first thing to understand is that we are um, going through in the UK what is a pretty natural evolution, I guess, for every country and has some implications in the US, which is that DFID was set up uh, with a very idealistic structure. So in the late 1990s, the idea was that the UK would commit to spend 0.7% of its GDP on international development, and it would create this completely independent department of government cabinet level department, which would have basically nothing to do with the Foreign Service or the Ministry of Defense. And it was set up by law that it could only spend money in order to tackle extreme poverty. And this was deliberately done because obviously the people working for it and setting it up wanted to try to protect it against any of the other temptations. So it was almost the purest possible kind of incarnation of a dream of development. Um, it was also set up so that there could not be any confusions with national interests. There were very, very clear legal protections to stop people using this money to try to procure British goods or do anything of the sort. From the beginning, this was an enormous problem and a problem that the people working for DFID probably did not fully anticipate or understand. They staffed the department with many, many people who were development economists or came out of NGOs. And they, at some level, people were very, very reluctant to get involved in the conversation with the public or other politicians about what this money was being used to do. And the scale of money you're talking to, so by the time I was running DFID, we had a budget of about 20 billion US dollars a year, totally unrestricted, right? I had no control at all about really how that money was spent because it was almost impossible for any other government department to get its hand on that money. In addition, austerity was taking place. So I remember this extraordinary meeting that I had with Rohini when I'd just been moved from my, I think my second post in DFID. I'd been moved to run UK prisons before I went back to DFID again. And I moved from this enormous office that I had in DFID, this tiny little uh, place in a concrete building I was sitting with Rohini. That morning I'd signed off on I think something like $200 million for an education program in Ethiopia. And that afternoon I'm sitting with Rohini now as the Minister for Prisons, realizing that we were gonna have to get rid of the bottom five floors of our office in central London in order to try to save I think nine or 10 million pounds, having just signed off on 200 million that morning. Um, and this of course meant that enormous problems were then raised about what on earth was happening with this money, right, when the public began looking at it. And you can think of all the kind of problems because we experienced them. And of course, this is relevant for Joe Biden, this is relevant to Jake Sullivan, this is relevant for Samantha Power, because of course, what Jake Sullivan has been writing about a great deal is the sense in which US foreign policy cannot be detached from what people, US citizens think. I mean, it's been for 60, 70 years, really an elite occupation. People have tried to remove foreign policy away from public opinion. But in the end, you have to justify it. You have to answer basic questions, right? So you say that you're eliminating global poverty. How are you doing? You know, what have you been doing over the last 40 years? Where are your success stories? You are working with this regime. So let's just run through some of the problems in Britain and then I'll just flip it back to human rights. Right? What were the practical problems? We were giving a uh, hundred million pounds a year to India. Why? Because India had a lot of poor people. But 
Uh, we then discovered that India was giving exactly 100 million pounds a year in development aid to Afghanistan. Right, so the British public is being asked to give 100 million pounds a year to India, and India is just giving all that money to Afghanistan. Right? Well, from the point of view of DFID employees, there was no problem with this because there were people living in extreme poverty in northern India, so they couldn't see why anybody found this a problem. Right? Or I would go in to see President Kagame in Rwanda, and I would talk about human rights, the big human rights problems in Rwanda, and he would laugh and say, you don't care about human rights. And I'd say, what do you mean I don't care about human rights? And he'd say, quite explicitly in this meeting, well, you've just given us another 100 million pounds of development aid. So if you cared about human rights, you wouldn't do that, would you? So these conversations are happening all the time. That's before you get onto the things that you can imagine, scandals about corruption, scandals about waste, huge anxieties in Britain, which haven't yet hit the United States, but I promise you they're coming about the amounts of money that people are spending then are paid running development agencies, right? Your average person in Britain who's being asked to give, and on average, your average British citizen would have had to give, if you look at the, compare the amount of money we were giving to the uh, working population, about $500 a year towards this, right? So imagine maybe you've got a lower income, you're giving in effect two, $300 a year towards this. It's very, very difficult for you to understand why somebody running a big charity is earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year because you think that this is being done um, as a sort of voluntary charitable activity you're imagining what's happening in international development in terms of you know what's happening in your local community somebody working on a very low income out of a great sense of idealism and suddenly you're having to confront the fact that these are organizations with contractors who are poverty experts earning fifteen hundred dollars a day doing poverty alleviation in somebody else's country, right? Um, now, let me just tie this back to, to human rights so we can now get into more of a conversation. Um, fundamentally, the question around human rights is how on earth do you, as the United States or the United Kingdom, or indeed anybody, develop country strategies? How do you decide whether or not you are going to, for example, give money to Rwanda and Ethiopia? Why do I choose them? I choose them because they they are amongst uh, the most brutal authoritarian regimes in Africa, and they are also the greatest development success stories in Africa. Right? They are the places that development economists are really excited by. They're almost the only two countries in, in, in Africa which people really get huge excited by because they've achieved 7 8% growth, even 9 10% growth um, over the last decade or so. Um, and what sort of leverage do you have? Because Somewhere implicit in this conversation is an idea that people had that you could improve the human rights performance of these countries by using the carrot of development aid as the way to do it. But in practice, that almost never works. Uh, and I saw it, and I'll finish with these two examples. I saw it in South Sudan, where my colleague and friend Mark Green, who was running USAID when I was running DFID, went in to see Salva Kiir, so horrible civil war happening in South Sudan. And the president of South Sudan, Salva Kiir, deeply implicated in incredible brutal massacres and horror and stealing our development assistance. So we'd send in food aid and it'd be stolen at the borders and people would be gunned down in Malakal. And Mark Green said, look, if you continue behaving like this, we will cut off the development program. And Salva Kiir effectively shrugged and said, fine. You know, you want to take the money away, that's your problem. If you want lots of poor people to starve, that's your problem. Take the money, I don't care. Right? And again, in Tanzania, uh, Magafuli, President Magafuli, who the great anti-COVID campaigner, whose anti-COVID campaign came to an unfortunate end a week ago, um, uh, refused to take a call from the US Secretary of State. The US ambassador refused to go and see him. He declared the US ambassador persona non grata, kicked him out. And the US government was effectively forced to come back again into Tanzania a couple of years later with a billion dollars worth of development assistance to try to buy their way back into the good graces of a relatively small country in sub-Saharan Africa. Because the assumptions that the US and the UK have about power, that somehow they can use even rather large sums of money as ways of changing the behavior of people in these countries, completely underestimates uh, the power of nationalism, state sovereignty, the actual incentives of people who are in political power, 
in countries ranging from Myanmar through to Tanzania, and really calls into question the extent to which it is actually possible, you know, even if it were desirable, actually possible to use development assistance as a lever for transforming attitudes to human rights. Okay, enough from me. Thank you, Rory. Uh, so Rory just talked about some of the limits of development aid as a carrot, or in fact saying it, it doesn't work, um, or there are many examples of it not working. So I'm curious, uh, before I ask some questions I have and get to questions from our audience, do any of our panelists wanna to react to that or react to anything else you heard uh, where you might be on the, the edge of your seat and have something to say? Otherwise we have some great questions coming in, but I wanted to give you all an opportunity. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, ask a question that Sam posed um, or, or turn it into a question. Sam, Sam basically said the question we're asking today, are human rights back on the international aid agenda, might not be the framing he would use, um, and that he's not quite sure we're really on the brink of major change. I'm curious, what do our other panelists think? Is this, is this a critical turning point or, or not necessarily? Let, 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 let me throw a second in and then come to other people. Um, it, it seems to me that part of this needs to be understood in terms of uh, competition with China, and in particular an attempt by President Biden and Boris Johnson and others to try to frame democracy as an alternative to authoritarian regimes. And so insofar as human rights gets back onto the agenda, I suspect a lot of it will be through the prism of trying to create a coalition of, in inverted commas, democracies. Um, in this uh, new form of competition or conflict with China. But again, and I think I'd love to hear from Melissa on this, the experience of the Cold War suggests that although you may talk about creating democracies as the alternative to your authoritarian rivals, in practice, you end up with cooperating with people who aren't democracies at all. I'm glad we're returning to the topic of China. Thoughts on that, Melissa? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's um, it's sort of a matter of degree in terms of like what you're doing and what you can achieve. And so I, you know, I agree that there is no, you know, like whether you're coming at it from the side of kind of the US or the Soviet Union during the Cold War, there's not like neither kind of group has a great track record of being able to essentially like um, force countries to, to take on their model, whether you look at the Soviet Union and Afghanistan, the US and Vietnam, um, you know, there's maybe some success stories like Panama um, comes to mind from the perspective of the US, but I think it just sort of like, it, it depends on what you want to achieve. And I, I agree that if the goal was to, you know, um, you, you have some brutal dictator and you think that with the carrot of this development aid, you're going to change his policies. Like that's just not realistic and that's just not going to happen. Um, but, you know, there, there have been like, you know, a series of studies looking, um, you know, in conflict zones in Afghanistan or Pakistan, the Philippines, um, looking at the role of the development aid programs. And I'd say the literature is kind of like a little bit mixed, um, you know, but there's some evidence um, that, that, that these programs, at least it's gonna depend on the details, but there can be success in terms of giving people like an alternative besides supporting the Taliban. Or so I think that when you think about things on kind of like a more um, granular level, um, as opposed to, um, you know, looking at uh, political change at the national level, that then there can be kind of more, um, more examples where things come sort of closer um, closer to um, achieving what the objectives are. But I, I agree that I don't think we really know how this works. We, we understand a lot more about what you would need to do in a world without politics to alleviate poverty than how you actually um, do that in a political context where there's people who just don't care or actually benefit from the fact um, that, that, that lots of people are living in poverty. Thanks, Melissa, and well put in terms of how this works in a world without politics versus a world with politics, which is part of the value in bringing uh, academics and practitioners together. Sam, I see you wanted to jump in. Uh, it's so interesting. I just, you know, I, I'm very averse to the general framing that we're, we're entering a, a, a new Cold War with China. I think it's, you know, disastrous that we're allowing Donald Trump uh, to define, you know, our own relationship to 
this coming era of geopolitics, not least since it seems really hard to think about the current Chinese state as similar to the Soviet Union in its broader agenda. I mean, of course, it is a communist state formally, but it's not like the global peasantry or its, you know, its leaders is being set on fire by communism or uh, as, uh, as an ideological matter or by neo-Confucianism or whatever you think uh, China represents. Uh, and, you know, we'd have to get into like re really serious debates uh, about what China's, you know, outward facing politics really are um, to figure out what kind of threat they they pose, unless by threat you mean that they're getting really rich really fast. Of course, it's absolutely true. Uh, and Rory's right about this, that they're they're repressing at home. And I think human rights are uh, of considerable use in thinking about what kind of China policy uh, Western states ought to have, you know, to, to get, get the, the Uyghurs some attention, although probably not much help. It's very different to suppose that the rise of China represents a kind of new era of competition globally, where we have to, like, you know, decide which despots we're going to prop up, uh, whether with Melissa we're, you know, on the brink of bombing a lot of peasants into, you know, capitalism. That does, it doesn't seem like we're anywhere close to that situation. Um, so, and so, you, please, sorry, please. Yeah, but just, I mean, I, 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 I look, I'm, my sympathies are with you on this, but I think that um, one of the oddities about the way that particularly departments of defense think is they like to have an enemy. And when they frame strategic security policies, they do these things. So Britain, for example, has just published its integrated security review. And the whole review is about a shift to the Indo-Pacific. It's so effectively it's moving out of the Middle East and Africa or trying to. Um, and a lot of the framing around the G10 meetings uh, are also around democracies. And in so far as um, we can read the tea leaves of the recent Blinken meetings with the Chinese. This is becoming more and more important. So I think it's possible for us to agree with you, Sam, this may not be a very sensible thing to do, but I think empirically, there's a lot of evidence that there's huge temptations from the national security establishments in Europe and in the United States of increasingly framing their whole international policy over the next 20 years. Oh, there, there's yes, no I, doubt about it. I, I mean, yeah. I concede that entirely, uh, but that, that they're not actually the political leadership. Uh, they're, they're supposed to be subordinate to it. Uh, but no, you're, of course, you're right that these forces are active and, you know, the, the, the national security expertise be quite far beyond militaries is always seeking enemies, as you say, um, I think the real dilemma is how to free development uh, assistance from that kind of politicization, but also recognize that the track record is grim for um, linking it to a kind of democratization and human rights uh, strategy. Um, first, that it's, it's not clear that these Western states don't in the end often side with despots uh, for the wrong reasons, but also when they when they side against them, they don't make that much of a difference. So, the, 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 I'm not you know, I'm I'm just kind of suggesting that if we in if we detach that discussion from the geopolitics of standing down China, we might kind of you know make a little more progress. But of course, you're right that we may not have a choice given that the lots of interests are leading us towards this new Cold War framing. Let me just jump in with Please. one question, I think, which is on moving from thinking about bilaterals to thinking about multilateral institutions. Um, and maybe the, when we think about the human rights, perhaps the one to really bring on stage is to think about the United Nations. Um, I think in the 1990s, uh, what we did see was the UN played quite an important role in terms of human rights by by entering the stage when a newly countries coming out of conflict were writing constitutions. So we saw a lot of uh, UN push there. The one that I'm the most familiar with is on gender quotas. So I think in country after country, the UN pushed very hard to have gender quotas put in place, for instance, in Rwanda. And it was accepted by the countries at that point in time because very often women were say less implicated in conflict. And so um, they were more willing to, to have them be part of it. 
And so, you know, certainly it's one reason why in Rwanda now it's a majority, uh, you know, female uh, parliament. Uh, and we can debate whether or not had it had a role, but that that's one place where I think the UN, which in many other places, you know, doesn't have much money or much influence, was able to strategically make a difference by entering on constitution writing. So I'd be curious if we sort of see places where um, perhaps maybe less bilaterals, but more multilaterals could enter. I think the flip side of the UN is the World Bank, which for the longest time said it would not engage with politics or governance. It was very explicit about it, but seems to have more recently been willing to start thinking about it, perhaps through a more anodyne term like state capacity. Very quickly on that one, I mean, I think the, you're, you're absolutely right. There's something very interesting that you pointed out there in Rwanda, because there's a paradox, isn't there? On the one hand, they've achieved these remarkable statistics in terms of female participation in parliament. On the other hand, it is an intensely authoritarian regime, which has included, you know, assassination of political opponents and all forms of repression. So the, I think this may be a rather interesting theme that could be pursued if we had more time about the ways in which uh, conversations about diversity and conversations about what we traditionally call liberty um, may be heading in different directions. In other words, that it would be possible to create a regime, and indeed I think they're beginning to emerge, which seem to um, resemble our uh, images of diversity without bringing the kinds of benefits um, in terms of liberty and maybe ultimately in terms of stability and peace that you would have anticipated. I just uh, add on to that, you yeah. know, I, I think Rohini's asked a really important question, but there's, there's a, in a way, a, 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 a history uh, to this present divergence that Rory notes. I mean, just to cite one example, uh, the authoritarian feminism of someone like Pin Princess Ashraf uh, of Iran before her brother's government was was toppled, uh, which which the the Western powers supported, of course, and that was another example where um, there there was a lot of talk about the regime's feminism, uh, uh, and 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 she in particular talked about a lot about it at, at global UN human rights conferences the world over, notably in the Tehran conference at night in 1968. But of course, that didn't mean that. Uh, the you know Iranian regime was bringing liberty uh, generally, and of course it it eventually paid the price. I want to bring in a few questions from our audience and um, keep them coming. Although I know we're running out of time, but there are some fantastic questions here, and we're we're kind of moving around geographically in these questions. But this is a question related to Central America and migration. So Ellen Messer asks. Uh, President Biden says that U.S. and Central American countries must address Central American sources, root causes of migration, which are extreme poverty and violence. There can be no U.S. national security, democracy, human rights, and freedoms at home until poverty eradication and human rights uplift people's lives everywhere. Can speakers comment on a possible human rights agenda for Central America? So uh, any thoughts on that? Then we have questions moving us around other parts of the world to follow. I think like, um, I'll just bring in a point that kind of like indirectly addresses this um, and that like, um, you know, this conversation seems like pretty pessimistic, but I think it's actually just realistic, um, you know, reflecting all the difficulties of going, you know, into a foreign country and changing the equilibrium there you know, whether it's eradicating extreme poverty, but also the politics of it. And that ties in a lot. And that's certainly true in Central America. Um, but it's also true that like, we can think about like, are there domestic policies that would have a huge impact um, on places like Central America, on the developing world? Because ultimately, like what we, like the world's like connected. And so like in the case of Central America, I mean, like one obvious thing is the war on drugs. And we know that it's completely like failed in the US. I mean, like, it's not that like it had no effect essentially, like on, you know, the number of Americans that have problems with drug addiction um, and just like fixing that own failed policy at home, even if we can never convince the American public to care one bit 
about Central America, just coming up with a more effective, you know, strategy like for drug addiction, you know, would have an effect. I know like a lot of the damage is done and there's also, you know, there's also other things at play, just a very weak state. Um, and that, that like kind of wanders into the realm of things that we don't really know how to, to, how to fix. Um, but, you know, um, just things like that are another huge point for Central America. And if we want to talk about extreme poverty is uh, climate change. And so um, when you look at predictions for like um, what the climate's going to look like in 2100, Central America looks like uninhabitable virtually. I mean, because it's already very hot and that's going to just get very much more extreme. And this is another thing I've done work on about how the impacts of extreme temperature are much more severe on poor countries. Um, and part of it's because they're hot, but also just they have kind of less coping strategies at hand. Um, and, you know, I think that there's like also a growing sense that climate change is bad for the US or is bad for Europe. I mean, look at California being on fire. So maybe like, you know, like even if we think that, um, that there's not a huge amount of hope for these um, kind of um, foreign aid, like development assistance, objectives if we are just like more modest there but you realize just by fixing some of the policy like you know getting policies more right like and going back to the like the biden thing about like well can this help the middle class in america like um you know maybe some of these policies like yes they can and they can be spun in that way but like they have the potential to have an effect that is much kind of larger than whatever you know, in the grand scheme of things fairly measly, like, you know, development aid. So I'm certainly not saying to abandon development assistance or, um, you know, the like these objectives of like, you know, state capacity as Rohini said, which is kind of how it gets framed like in the context of Central America or, you know, development assistance. But I think that, you know, like as we've talked about, they don't have a great track record and maybe like another perspective on it is that by, you know, fixing some of these problems at home, um, we're less likely to just have this collateral damage or go and be, you know, propping up dictators or doing these other things that have horrible effects. Sam, I see you wanted to jump in quickly. Yeah, no, I, I think the question's really well taken because apart from the, let's say, difficult optics that Joe Biden faces to the extent he has to, you know, um, have exclusionary uh, uh, politics at the border of any kind, um, he has, uh, you know, and, and liberals generally have a difficulty of figuring out how to connect the short term and the long term. So in the short term, with folks at the border, there is a human rights obligation minimally to hear and grant, you know, legitimate asylum claims, um, even when migrants are economic uh, uh, migrants and converting their claims into the kind of claims that can be taken seriously. But in the long term, uh, it's not clear to me that the, the global anti-poverty agenda is ever going to by itself alleviate um, the drivers of migration. And this is an opportunity for me to introduce like the main theme of my recent book, which is a contrast between these ideas about sufficient provision, whether generous or ungenerous, and this very different idea of, of, of more egalitarian living standards. It seems like dubious to me that once a peasant gets above a dollar and change a day, he'll decide not to move to the United States if he can get there. Uh, and so uh, I totally agree with Melissa about the looming climate uh, refugee crisis, but quite apart from it, if we don't focus our development thinking on greater equalization over the long term of standards of living, we will have economic migration for as long as we can see. And then the attendant border politics that, that you know, are across Mediterranean politics that we've seen have roiled the world in recent decades. I wanna bring in one more question and um, it, it has to do with China and I was hoping to bring it in earlier, but I think I'd like to broaden the frame as Rohini did earlier, thinking not just in terms of bilaterals, but multilaterals. Um, and we'll, we'll have a quick go around on this question and then I wanna have time for closing thoughts. But um, Thomas Kingston asks, Having worked in human rights law in Cambodia and having witnessed their government's shift from a pro-European, pro-US stance to a pro-China stance, it seems to me that there's a limitation of how human rights promotion can be achieved through aid, 
especially in less democratic systems, when China is offering support that comes without moral or democratic obligations? How can this be overcome or is it just going to result in a bidding war? So I think this builds on some of what we discussed earlier, but what I appreciate about this question is it's from the perspective of countries receiving assistance. And, and I think you see this playing out in many countries in Africa as well, receiving assistance from China. Um, but any quick thoughts in response to that question? Because I wanted to bring in a, a perspective from the audience on China. So very quickly, I think the, the big change since the UN intervention in Cambodia is the incredible shift in the sort of status, prestige, power, and weight of China is the big fact over the last 20 years. I mean, from a British point of view, one way of thinking about it is that um, in 2005, the British economy was larger than the Chinese economy. And the Chinese economy is now seven times larger than the British economy. So that's happened just in 15 years. The same relationship uh, has a, a emerged throughout the world, really. And therefore, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Cambodia or whether you're talking about Zimbabwe. Um, the basic story of the weight and prestige of the, the United States and its allies seem to have in the 1990s has evaporated and been replaced by that status of China. And Thanks, Roy. Sam, I see you wanted to jump in there. Yeah, just to, briefly, it's it, we shouldn't forget that that geopolitical competition is sometimes a great boon to the world's peoples, especially when they can play competing hegemons uh, off against each other. So we, Melissa's story is great, but we shouldn't think the alternative is, you know, force and hearts and minds, which in any way was never unconnected from force in the Vietnam case, like the Phoenix program and things like that. Um, but the broader story of Cold War development is that there are a lot of canny actors across the global South who understood that they could play rivals off against each other to get more from each. Uh, a great example of that is in David Engerman, our colleague's recent book, The Price of Aid, about how Indian statesmen, basically planners and others were able to take a lot from both Americans and the Soviet Union because they knew that uh, their generosity was, was not just uh, innocent, but reflected these uh, competing uh, you know, comp competition ide ideologies. Sam actually just mentioned one of our panelists from the first of our uh, Yale Development Dialogue series. So it brings it full circle. Um, we only have a couple minutes left and I wanna make sure to go back to each of you with any closing thoughts. Um, earlier, I think it was Melissa who said, we're not being pessimistic, just realistic, but um, I don't know if there's a chance to end on a note of optimism. Uh, I, I think what I'd love to hear from each of you is um, kind of back to where we began. Why this question, why now? And what do you hope to see? So anything more forward looking, um, who wants to jump in? Rory. Okay, I mean, I, I, I'd say just closing thoughts. First thing is that at the core of a lot of what we're talking about is basically modernization theory, this idea from the 1950s that there is somehow some natural relationship between being prosperous, uh, being free and being democratic. And we are struggling now partly because of China, partly because of populism, with the possibility that those things don't go as naturally together as we assumed. Um, however, um, I would say, if you want me to end with a note of optimism, and this may be touched on, this is saying, I have seen a lot of very good small scale programs on support to human rights. And I feel in Pakistan and Bangladesh, for example, that small amounts of money supporting civil society organizations, some very, very courageous civil society organizations has been extraordinary. And the counterfactual, you know, what would happen if there had been no support whatsoever for human rights campaigners working on minority communities in Pakistan, I think is very, very worrying indeed. So I think it's, it's a very good thing for development agencies to do. I think it's always going to be a very small part of their budget because in fact, if what you're talking about is supporting activists on the ground, that's not going to remotely compare with the, you know, $20 billion that you're putting into the the other stuff. But I, I think there is still scope to do a lot. And I think we can continue to do it when conditions allow. Thanks, Rory. I want to close with Rohini, but first Sam or Melissa, do either of you want to jump in with any final thoughts in our, we're at time, but I want to make sure to bring you in if you have something else. I, I completely agree with what was just said. Um, so oftentimes in this in like development, there's this big debate between like, oh, doing these like, you know, big picture things that will like, you know, 
like make a dramatic difference, you know, the GP and like on a big picture versus the smaller scale programs um, where um, it's just easier to see success because the number of things that need to change to make a dramatic difference in kind of levels of poverty are just huge and we don't really have an understanding of how politics works or the economics works and so it's not we should be asking those questions I think they're important questions, um, but it's easier to see and actually to evaluate the successes um, when you look at some of the smaller scale. Um, program. So I agree that like for political reasons, that's never going to be the main thing, um, but that that should be kind of a central, a central thing moving forward, just because we have more hopes when we're making small changes and are trying to make small changes that we know that 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 we're going to see um, effectiveness there. And so I think that, you know, in addition to having these kind of ambitious talks about how is everything changing and it's a new paradigm, um, you know, just, just thinking about the things that have worked, even if they're small scale um, and, you know, doing what we can to advocate for those. And as I said, also to, you know, thinking about, you know, trying to have more appreciation for how, you know, there's policies that can actually benefit the the home countries that are supporting this aid benefit you know the median voter um and um also um benefit um people elsewhere in the world thanks melissa sam final thoughts from you uh, sure well you know there's always ground for optimism they have to involve seizing opportunities and and i i'd go back to the very beginning with rohini and rory about the opportunity that is is open to us now because elites in wealthy countries are frightened mm. uh, and they they've been they know they've been thrown out of power in some cases and they're they're eager to figure out what that means um, and change their ways Jake Gul Sullivan is a great example who remarked in 2017 uh, that he had the humility of the defeated uh, and I think like Blinken uh, Sullivan other, others are evolving in really interesting ways uh, the question is what they do next, and I think we should warn them against a repeat of the Cold War uh, for uh, some of the reasons Melissa uh, mentioned, but also because it doesn't even seem to make any sense uh, with the new adversary um, uh, and instead push them in, in ways that will, will make the world's peoples better off uh, in, a, in, in a series of ways. Rohini, back to you to close. I, I thank you for putting this topic on our agenda for the series. I think it's been fascinating. What are your final thoughts? Um, I think I'll just echo what all the panelists say. Maybe the one thing I would add, which is a bit inward looking for the US that just given the huge role that I would say tech giants are playing now, a lot of what the US is going to decide to do in terms of antitrust, in terms of how to um, you know, uh, get them to um, think about uses of data of when it's going to be used for surveillance, when it's going to be used for transparency. I think it's going to be incredibly important in a lot of uh, low income countries, but also in countries like Hong Kong, uh, China, other places where, you know, what we're seeing is that ability to for civil society and others to protest to push for human rights depends a lot on how they are being able to use social media right now for coordinating protests. Thank you, Rohini. Well, I know we're over time. Thank you all for bearing with us. Um, I am really glad though that we were able to go back and hear from each of our panelists on this very important topic. Um, and I think we, we're emerging with more questions that need to be answered, but we'll keep the conversation going. Um, we look forward to seeing all of you in our next uh, iteration of the Yale Development Dialogue series, where again, we're bringing together historians and practitioners for conversations on these complex topics as they affect low and middle income countries. I think this was a great uh, example of why there's such value in that framing. So thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our attendees and we'll see you next time.